Hey, how you doing? Welcome back to the channel. Good to have you here as always. So today I'm going to talk about something pretty personal, something pretty emotional. I want to talk about the day I died. Not in the physical sense. Obviously, I wouldn't be here if I had actually physically died, but I want to talk about the death of my old life, the death of my ego, and how I made the changes in my life to get me to where I am now. And I really want to talk about it this week because this week in New Zealand is Mental Health Awareness Week. And worldwide, it is also Suicide Prevention Month. And I think it's super important that we all talk about this. We need to normalize it. I want to share my story. So as I've said in many of my videos, I grew up in New Zealand all throughout the 80s. You know, I was a typical Kiwi teen kid. Life was kind of normal and then life was kind of crazy. I come from a broken family where there was a lot of abuse. All of that affected me all throughout my teens through depression. But when I actually tried to talk about it, to share, uh, yeah, no. I got shut down all the time by my family, by my friends, by my teachers, by everyone around me, even partners. You didn't talk about it in those days. You didn't talk about your mental health problems. If you were depressed, you were told to take a cup of concrete, harden up and get on with life. The only problem is, is when you don't know how to actually get away from those depressive thoughts, when you don't know how to deal with suicidal thoughts it doesn't matter how much concrete you drink it's not going to change anything so all the way up into my late teens my early 20s I struggled and I struggled alone with this depression anytime I got stressed or angry or anything like that it really made the depression worse I never really had a lot of suicidal thoughts in my early teens or even you know up into my later teens but I had friends who had actually committed suicide. I lost about six of my friends in my early teens to suicide. Uh, New Zealand at the time actually had the highest teenage suicide rate in the world. It was a pretty dark place. It was pretty depressing. You know, in my later teens, I'd started tattooing, but it was only kind of part time. I was also working as an escort driver and a security guard at a brothel. Yeah, the Regal Lounge in Christchurch, which my mother was the manager of for 14 years. I hung out of the place long enough, they gave me a job. I was kind of living this whole, uh, you know, gangster life even then. Driving escorts in Christchurch was a bit of a dangerous job, and the guys that I worked for were pretty dangerous people. You know, it was pretty crazy, but for me it was good because, yeah, all of this craziness didn't translate into depression. So I was like, oh, I'm okay with this. But then when I was about 20, I was dating one of the girls. We'd been dating for a while and she played head games with me. She loved it. She thrived on it. And I guess that was her way of dealing with her mental health issues was to project it onto me and mess with my head. I hadn't experienced that and it caused massive depression in me. So much to the point where one night, I couldn't take any more of her bullshit. And I jumped in my car and I drove around and that's when I started having suicidal thoughts. All of this chaos inside of my head just wouldn't shut up. It wouldn't quieten down. And then one popped into my head and said, you know, if you end your life, it will stop. And I went, well, wow, okay, maybe this is a solution. It didn't feel right to me. And I thought, no, I need to go talk to someone. I drove to a friend's house at 2 a.m knocked on her door and she sat with me for hours talking to me allowing me to open up and share and I'll always be grateful to you Yvonne for that it made me realize that opening up about this actually talking about it when everyone said you're not supposed to actually did help me at that time in New Zealand there were very few people who would listen and going into therapy or counseling no that wasn't a thing because it was stigmatized. It would look down on you if you went into therapy. Uh, okay, cool. I'll just get on with life. I'm good now. I broke up with that girl. And eventually I ended up moving to Australia. Uh, you know, tried to, you know, fix my life a little. Really, I got really caught up in the party scene. I, you know, started hanging out with the MC. And then, of course, you know, lots of craziness going on but there was so much going on and for the longest time throughout my 20s i was in a bit of a chemical state 
So I was never really depressed. Well, not that I ever noticed, but that darkness was still there and it's still building because I never talked about it. I never talked about my depression. You know, if I got down, I just wouldn't talk to anyone. I would withdraw into myself. I would just be like, nah, don't want to go out. Don't want to go to the clubhouse. Don't want to go party. I'd just, you know, leave me alone for a few days. And eventually after a couple of days, this craziness in my head would kind of subside a little bit. But there are also, at times, those suicidal thoughts. Those started popping into my head a lot more frequently, especially in my mid to late 20s. In my late 20s, my early 30s, I was heavily involved with the MC. And then eventually started hanging out with the skinhead gang. And that is where the madness really started for me. All this craziness in my head, all this depression. And I realized that many of the guys in the gang and in the scene had the same issues. And we actually talked about some of our issues, not about how to deal with it, but just sharing. And for me, that was actually comforting in a lot of ways and kind of a messed up way. But because I was living such a negative, hateful existence, you know, being part of that, life wasn't going well for me. And as a result, every time I got stressed, you know, the depression would start in, but then I started having physical effects of the depression. You know, I ended up with liver failure at one stage and I don't drink alcohol. So for me, that was wild. But my doctor said, your liver's just basically shut down. It's just shut down for a while. I went, oh, I don't know why. Depression and mental health issues will have an effect on you physically. Trust me, they really will. So after a few years, you know, of all this madness, you know, my marriage breaking down, and then I left the skinhead gang. That life is just gone. So I didn't have all that chaos to kind of keep me in check. So I had a lot of time alone with my thoughts, and that's when the depression really started to rise. And I tried to escape it by traveling. You know, I traveled to the United States and hung out with friends there, but it was always the same. You know, things would just deteriorate for me because I was carrying these thoughts with me. I was carrying this depression and the suicidal thoughts became more and more prevalent, especially in my mid thirties to my late thirties. Everything got kind of stressful for me. And then I had to return to New Zealand. Uh, my mother was seriously assaulted in a home invasion and I immediately returned to New Zealand. Not wanting to, I didn't want to go back there, but I knew I had to be there for my family. And I did, I went back and helped my family. And all the while knowing that I needed to work on myself, you know, well, there's a little voice in the back of my head said, you know, you've got to really make some changes about your life. The last few years, it's been the same patterns and it's all around depression and the stress, not realizing that all that stress was a result of my depression and my mental health state. It was what I was projecting out into the world. It was coming back to me. And so when I went back to New Zealand, I still ignored everything. I still tried to live that life. I started working security for a while, but then some friends of mine talked me into opening a tattoo studio. I was hesitant about it. I really didn't want to do it. I knew that it was just so much stress involved in opening a studio, running a studio, and it was full time. It was full on work. And it was. The eight months that I had that studio, it was crazy. It was a very busy studio. And I had to drive an hour and a half every day to the studio and then back again to get home. And it was taking a toll on me mentally and physically. And it got to the point where one day at the studio, I collapsed. I passed out. Uh, I woke up in the hospital and they said my liver had actually shut down. I'm like, ah. You know, and this sounds kind of familiar, but at that time, the suicidal thoughts were becoming so full on. It was getting crazy up there. It was at the point where I was sitting at a pub one night and I was having a meal and I didn't even know that I was having a meal. And it was like, I woke up out of this dream and I looked around and I went, where am I? What am I even doing here? And then I realized that part of me was having a farewell dinner because this darkness inside of me was taking over and I was preparing myself to take my own life. That scared me. That really scared me, but it didn't change anything. Now, soon after that, uh, my friends who helped me open the studio screwed me over. I lost that studio and I went into one of the worst depressions I'd ever experienced in my life. 
I didn't want to wake up most days because when I did open my eyes, the first thing that popped into my head was this darkness telling me to end it all. This is your way out. This is how you can get away from this darkness, from this stress to take your own life. And after a couple of months of this, of just feeling beat down, just feeling worthless in life. I had started working at another tattoo studio in a really bad part of town. It wasn't a great studio. I'd lost a lot of my client base. Majority of it was through my depression. I just didn't want to work anymore. There was one Saturday. It got too much. It got way too much for me. I've been sitting there trying to get work in. No one was coming in. I had no money. I couldn't even buy food. I couldn't pay rent. And I thought, this is it. Yeah, this has got to be the end. And the voices were telling me, yeah, 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 do it. Just do it. And I jumped on my Harley and I went for a ride around the hills with the intention of just drowning out these voices. Yeah, because the Harley was loud enough for it did a lot of the time. But this one time it wouldn't. And these voices were just so loud, it's all I could hear. And I got to the point where I come up to a right-hand bend and I went, I'm, I'm going left. There's a cliff over that side. And I did. I started maneuvering towards that, that, that left hand bend with the intention of just ending it. The moment I did, a voice inside of me went, I can't do this anymore. What was that? Because it didn't come from here. It came from here. I went, whoa, pulled the bike off, kind of slid. I went, oh, shit, what's going on? I need to figure this out. I need to do something. And I went home. I smoked a lot of weed with the intention of finishing the job. I was like, I'm not done yet. But then a friend actually intervened. You know, he called the police. He knew what was going on. Yeah, he called the police to make sure I was okay. And they turned up on my doorstep. And it kind of interrupted that whole darkness, the whole, you know, whatever I was going to do. And my friend contacted me and I talked to him for hours after that. And I'll always be grateful to you for that. But it was at that point that I realized I need to make a change. I can't keep living this life anymore. And so, yeah, the next day I opened up. I told all my family, all my friends. I told everyone what had happened to me and what was going on in my head. Very few of them actually understood. Most of them didn't care. Actually, most of them cut me off completely. Mental health at that time still wasn't something that was really talked about even in New Zealand and I realized that I needed a change because I was the only one I could turn to for help and I did I sought out therapy and that completely changed my life in fact soon after that I had an awakening and it was just a moment a moment of realization that I had finally left that life behind all that life, all the depression, all the darkness that had brought me to that point died that day. So my old self, my ego, it died. And I was given the chance to start a new life. And I opened my eyes and went, I am going to be okay. I am going to be okay. And that was the start of my journey. That's the day I decided to live. And here I am now, eight years later, talking to you because I made those steps. I made those changes. So do I still have suicidal thoughts today? Do I still have depression? Yes, I absolutely do. Healing isn't an instant process. It takes time, as everything takes time. It took me years to learn how to tattoo. It took me years to learn how to ride a motorbike. And it's taken me years to learn how to live free from suicidal thoughts, depression, anxiety. I am still learning how to do it. And now I have tools that I can use to help me through those times. But when I don't use them, if I don't meditate, if I'm not mindful, if I allow that stress back into my life, then yes, there are times when thoughts of suicide do come back into it. A lot of the time, as I've said in one of my other videos, when I smoked weed for the longest of time and ignored all my mental health issues, that's when the suicidal thoughts became really prevalent. But the difference is, is I know that when that darkness comes back, when that stress starts to rise or I feel depressed, I know I can actually do something about it now. Instead of being punished by these thoughts and having to consume whatever just to block it out, 
now I know there is a way. And for me, a lot of it is through meditation, which I'm actually going to talk about on Sunday's video. But just know that if you have these thoughts, if you struggle with depression or suicidal thoughts, there is always a way to heal. There is a way to step out of the darkness. And it's different for every person. No two people are ever going to be alike. But there are some common tools that you can use. Mindfulness, meditation, exercise, going out of nature, yoga, all this kind of stuff. You know, it sounds a bit hairy-fairy hippie, but trust me, it works. Just know that, yes, there are ways out and there are ways to change your life. I've done it and many other people have too, and I know you can. So that's it for today. I am going to continue this more on Sunday. I actually want to talk to you about a lot of the methods and techniques and practices, and I'm going to show you some stuff. I'm going to show you a bit of meditation and breath work and some exercise routines that have helped me and that may actually help you. So I'll see you on Sunday. Thanks so much for being here. Appreciate you being here as always. And if you want to keep supporting the channel, which so many of you do, especially my mate Tommy out there, thank you, mate. Your support the last few weeks has meant the world to me. I can't thank you enough. No, but if you want to keep supporting me and supporting the channel, of course, you can buy merchandise. Yes, I have merchandise that I make. And you can buy me a coffee. Um, coffee is great for your mental health. Trust me. <laughs> Or, as always, you can just give this video a big like. And if you haven't already, there's a little button that says subscribe. Hit that, and you'll be seeing new videos from me every Sunday and Thursday night at 7 p.m. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in, and love and light to you all.